Hi everyone, we're here at Connie Out Like That, and I'm here with my good friend Dr. Donnie Consla, and we're going to be talking about heart disease. But before we start, I wanted to mention one, re one thing. We're doing this particular program because, in this case, many people have made reference to this to me and have said they wish we would do this particular program because I guess it's something that can be somewhat common with, mm -hmm. with dogs. Mm -hmm. So if you, and just a side comment here, if you come up with a topic you would like to see us do, something that has been diagnosed in your dog, something you've heard about, something you don't understand, give me a call, either call down here and talk to, uh, leave a message for Dr. Consla, or call the, the dog park and leave a message for me and then we'll be able to do that one. But that's, how, that's why we're doing this one. Uh, two people, very good friends, both had an issue with this and they said, when are you gonna do that? So keep that in mind if you come up with any good ideas. So, back to the boss. Perfect. Heart so, disease. Yeah, we're gonna talk about um, uh, heart disease today and that's kind of a, a big term that encompasses uh, a lot of different forms uh, of heart disease. So. We'll um, kind of go over just some normal things, you know, where the heart is at, how you can check uh, the heart rate uh, mm -hmm. at home, um, and monitor some, some signs of the heart working well. Uh, I'll kind of show you where it's at on, a, uh, on the dog, um, go over some normals. We'll talk about uh, some of the normal structures of the heart, and then we can get into what happens when there are different uh, pathologies or diseases of those particular areas. Uh, what those look like, how we diagnose it, what can we do about it, all that good stuff. And one of the things we never want to forget is what can the pet owner do mm -hmm. if they get a, do they need to have a stethoscope, is, do they need to be counting pulse, do they need to be counting right. respirations, and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. at some point we need to do a program on that. Yeah. Because there's some things that people, it's like the um, first aid for dogs, the American Red Cross doesn't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things that people can monitor themselves and really help as far as the diagnosis. So whenever right. they come in to see you or any local vet, they can say, well, I've been watching this for a week and these are the things that I've seen. These are the so let's talk are, about that these too. These are the things that are changing. Now, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm not an artist. So I already noticed that. Uh, don't judge me too harshly on my, uh, my images here, okay? Well, I, I usually uh, do stick figures, so anything bigger than stick figures is is I think you have that already on there. You're not doing that freehand. I'm, well, uh, the head is getting a little skewed here. It is. Well, it's, well it looks more like a like a uh, Shih Tzu with uh, the shortened nose. So okay. All right. So here's our dog. Okay. Um, so the key thing to notice here is the the point of the elbow. Okay. That's going to be your friend. Right, okay. Right there. there we okay. Go. That's supposed to be an elbow. So if I draw a, a heart on here. That's our heart. It's not really heart shaped, right? Like right. Valentine heart shaped, okay? Um, but that's kind of where it sits, okay? On the left side of the dog. Well, it, it, if we looked at a dog on, it, on its belly, or on its back, excuse me, so if the, the head was up here and the tail was down here, mm -hmm. the heart actually kind of sits at an angle like that. Oh really? So if, if this dog is on his back, you know, this is the right side and this is the left side. Um, but this is helpful, okay? So our, our dog standing here, this is the left side that we're looking at, mm -hmm. right? And we know that the heart is sitting at the ch in the chest um, at, at this angle. And so um, if we kind of subdivide the heart into two sections, um, up here, the upper half, we have the atria, mm -hmm. okay? And on the bottom, we have the ventricles. And how many chambers just for A interest? dog has a four-chambered heart. Just like we So, do. technically, you could split this in half again, and you have a right atria, uh, a left atrium, a right ventricle, and a left ventricle. Just like their owner. Yeah. Okay. Just like good. us, okay? Okay, we're good. So, um, interestingly, the, the atrium, now the, these are all muscle-based chambers, okay? Um, so they have uh, contractility, they can mm -hmm. squeeze. But the ventricles are what do most of mm -hmm. the, the squeezing. And we'll kind of talk about some of the, the plumbing and, and things as, as we go through. Um, but just keep in mind that the ventricles are, are the bigger of the two uh, chambers as far as uh, squeezing power goes, if you will. And the left ventricle in particular is very strong. So the most contractility is kind of coming from this uh, left ventricle over here. So on the left side of the dog, 
that ends up being right over over there. Oh, okay. and that's why we drew it by the elbow in the left side. Right. Okay, now so, we got gotcha. you. Uh, we call this the apex of the heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so apex is kind of like a you know like a point, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, and then the other half would be like the base of the heart. Okay. And so we can feel for what we call the apex beat. Okay. So if you feel even on your own chest, you can feel you know that pounding of the heart. Sure. That's that left ventricle squeezing. Okay. So on your dog, if he's standing or she is standing like this, you find the point of the elbow. If it's a short-haired dog, you can actually see it. You can see that little uh, pulse, that, that, that bounding going. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that is also where you can feel. Okay. So you can put your hand there, right here, behind the, the elbow. It's about the sixth rib space if you really want to get fancy and count. Uh, most people <laughs> in a panic aren't doing that. Right. Um, but you can feel. Now it's a good idea when your dog is nice and happy and healthy to feel so you know exactly where it's at and you can kind of get used to feeling it. So if something weird is happening, you know, you can take a pulse or if you're talking to your vet uh, on an emergency call and they say, can you take the pulse for me, they, you can tell them what it would be. Um, so that's kind of where um, that is at and where you can feel. So for uh, our dogs, a normal heart rate is 80 to 120 beats per minute, okay? Um, why is there such a big range uh, size? Okay, mm -hmm. if we're talking a Chihuahua, it's gonna be 120 is normal. Right. If you're talking a Great Dane or a super athletic uh, lab mix or something, might be closer to 80, okay? Um, if the dog is excited, you know, bright and alert, unless it's a giant breed dog, it really shouldn't be all that low. Um, if they're excited, it might be a little higher. You know, if they just got done playing fetch or something, that's going to make the heart rate go up. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a resting heart rate, uh, assuming everything is normal and there's no excitation or anything otherwise. Okay. Okay. So uh, where else can you feel the pulse? Um, this is the easiest, this apex beat here. Um, but you can also feel it back here. Uh, and the femoral artery on the inside, inside of the leg, the leg. is, is right. coming down. I've seen um, that done. And that's, that can be harder to find for a lot of people, just if you're not used to doing it all the time. But essentially, if you can find the femur, you know, the big bone that runs through here, then you can kind of just come off of it and feel it. Again, that's mm -hmm. one you would want to practice um, before, uh, you know, it's an emergency situation. Right. And you got to check it out. Um, so that's kind of just some general uh, how to feel certain things, and uh, how to check the pulse at home. People should do that too. Yeah, you know, it, it's a good idea because when I call people on emergency, there are times where I'll ask, um, you know, maybe the, the dog had a, a passing out episode or um, is acting like really hyperactive, and I'll say, you know, can you take the pulse for me? And, and pretty much anybody uh, can do it. You know, they don't have any uh, issues with mm -hmm. it. So it is something that's helpful. So let's talk about um, the heart uh, itself and kind of its main components here, okay? So this is roughly the shape of our heart here, okay? Again, we've got our base and our apex down mm -hmm. here, okay? So let's draw a few more uh, structures here. Wow. Yeah, oh yeah. Just the rest of the body, right? Yep. Okay. That's okay. my uh, health teaching. Uh huh. Yes, I knew where all these things were. Okay. So let's start with blood coming into the heart, okay? So we'll make this um, our right side and this our left side, okay? So blood is going to come in. Uh, this is called the, uh, the caudal vena cava, okay? Uh, it's a big vein, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to drain into the right atrium. Mm -hmm. So that's the first chamber that we encounter. So that right atrium is receiving uh, blood from the rest of the body. It's going to squeeze and push blood down into the right ventricle. Okay. Now, 
I'll try and draw it over here. And that goes to the lungs. And that goes to the lungs, okay? So blood comes in from the body. So this is blood that's already been used, right? right? Um, it's, it's delivered all of its oxygen, every, oxygen everywhere, so it, it's kind of oxygen deficient. Those hemoglobin molecules don't have the, the oxygen attached to them. So we got to get it re-oxygenated before we send mm -hmm. it out to the rest of the body. So it comes into the right atrium, goes down to the right ventricle. The right ventricle is going to squeeze and send blood to the lungs. Okay, so the blood goes to the lungs, and there's a bunch of stuff happens there that we won't get into, um, but it basically picks up oxygen. That's right. the most important part, but this is going to play a role when we talk about some of our heart disease, okay? So blood goes to the lungs, it gets oxygenated, and then it comes through another vein. This is the pulmonary artery, this is the pulmonary vein. Um, it comes through the pulmonary vein into the left atrium, mm -hmm. so now we're on the other side of the heart and then it goes down into the left ventricle. Remember, that's our real muscular portion, and it's gonna squeeze all that blood into the aorta and out to the body. And again, just like it does in a human being. Right, Okay. exactly. So then we have, uh, so that's kind of the pathway uh, of things and how those chambers kind of play a role and some of our, our other major vessels uh, mm -hmm. that are, are going on here. So uh, we've got the vessels, that's one structure that we can talk about where diseases can happen. We've got these different chambers, which are all muscle-based. Uh, so that's another uh, issue where things can happen with the heart muscle. Uh, what's controlling all of this is nerves. So there's little nerves up here and these little nodes, and they send a signal and it goes down and it hits another node, and then it comes down and sends off little fibers. So we have the conduction system mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of keeping pace of this whole thing. And then we have one other structure, the valves. So I kind of drew some here, right? These little leaflets here. So this would be our um, uh, tricuspid valve and our bicuspid valve. And then we have an aortic valve there and then a pulmonic <laughs> valve there. So you already know all this I stuff. do, I do. I'm, but it's nice to hear it again, it's been yeah. a long time. So we've got four uh, valves uh, and we can have issues there as well, okay? Any questions about any of the main structures or anything like that that you can think of that anybody might have? Mm -mm. Okay. So um, we said that we can have problems in, in any of these areas, basically. Do you have one you want to start with? No, your choice. Okay. So I guess first of all, um, before we get into the, the diseases real quick, um, one of the things that we always do uh, as, as part of the exam is listen to the, the heart and mm -hmm. the lungs and feel those pulses, usually in the back legs. So what are we doing when we listen to the heart? So we're listening to the heart sounds, so the, the lub-dub, lub-dub. Oh, uh, very good. We're listening to the characteristics of that. Mm -hmm. uh, does it sound normal? Um, are there any uh, abnormal noises in there? So the main abnormal noise that we hear would be a heart murmur and we'll kind of talk about how that factors into some of these diseases in a little bit. But uh, a heart murmur is basically, there's some turbulent blood flow happening in the heart. It can be uh, a benign change, it's not always bad, um, but it tells us that blood isn't going down and out perfectly smoothly, okay? Right. And we'll talk about in diseases uh, where that, that change is happening. Um, we can hear things like uh, clicks and stuff like that. We're listening to the rhythm of the heart. Um, is, it, is it consistent? Is it a normal, you know, on, on rhythm? Mm -hmm. um, now, a, a phenomenon that we hear in dogs a lot uh, is called a sinus arrhythmia. Sounds very scary, uh, but it's normal. Um, and so if you listen uh, to the heart, or I've actually had own owners comment on it, and they're like, you know, when, when I, I see his heartbeat or I feel it, it doesn't seem like it's a normal rhythm. Like it seems like it speeds up oh, okay. and slows down. Just so, when the dog is just laying down? Just when they're just sitting there, okay. yeah. Okay, all right. So um, dogs uh, have this, it, it, people can have it, cats can have it, but mm -hmm. it's, it's very prominent in dogs. And so, um, it's sinus, that means this little node up here, the sinus node, is kind of regulating it. Um, and it happens because when you take a breath in, more blood returns to the heart from the body, right? There's an increase right. in pressure. And then when you take a breath out, the opposite happens. So 
when you breathe in, more blood comes in, so it has to you know, kind of process it through faster. So this little note up here speeds up the heart rate so it can handle that volume change. And then when you breathe out, it slows it, slows back, it back down. down. Okay? So that's a normal thing that we can see in, in dogs. So if people you know, are watching this and they start listening or feeling for heartbeats and stuff and they notice that, it could be normal. Of course, if you're concerned, have your vet check it. The, the key difference is that sinus arrhythmia that is normal will always line up uh, with the respiratory pattern, okay? okay? So if it's speeding up and slowing down and it's not in sync with the breaths, then that's not normal, okay? Um, so we're listening to the rhythm, uh, we're listening for weird sounds, we're listening to the lungs uh, with some heart diseases. You can get mm -hmm. fluid and hear crackles or harsh lung sounds and different things like that. And then you'll often notice, you know, as we're, we're listening with a stethoscope on one hand, we'll be feeling back and feeling that femoral pulse with the other hand and seeing if the, the heart lub dub, that apex beat, right, that the owner can feel at home, does that line up with the femoral pulse? Or are we getting some skipped uh, beats or skipped pulses, mm -hmm. things like that on the back end? Um, so that's kind of what happens. Um, during the, the normal uh, exam. And we'll get into some of the more specific tests after we talk about some of these diseases. Um, so let's talk about uh, valve disease first, because that, that's a pretty common one, okay? Um, so probably the most common area that we see um, valve issues is in this bicuspid and tricuspid mm -hmm. valve here, the mitral valve. Right, um, that's very common in humans too. Yes. That's yep. commonplace. Um, these dogs are your small breed dogs, so Chihuahuas, Shih Tzus, King Charles, Cavalier Spaniels, huge, hugely overrepresented there. Um, uh, all those little guys most commonly uh, are, are presenting for this. And what happens with them is they have a degenerative process of these valves here. And so these little valve leaf leaflets will actually start to scar over mm -hmm. and shrink up essentially. And so what happens and why they get a murmur is this gap becomes wider, okay? So you got the board there? I do. So instead of the leaflets uh, snapping together and making a nice seal, right? Mm -hmm. So when this goes to squeeze, you don't want it to be open or it's just gonna go back up into the right. atria. So it has to make a nice seal so when it squeezes, it goes out the pulmonary artery or the aorta. When those valves start to scar over and degenerate, what does scar tissue do? It, it contracts. Mm -hmm. And so we start to get a little opening. So they open, the blood goes from the atria down to the ventricle, but when they go close, there's a little gap there. It leaks back. And so, yeah, when it, when it squeezes, it leaks back mm -hmm. through this opening into the atria. So the murmur that we hear is the regurgitation of blood back up mm -hmm. into that, that atrium. Um, and so that's kind of how uh, that process goes. You've probably heard of, um, in people especially, like vegetative endocarditis. That's where we get infection on these leaflets. It's not super common um, in dogs, uh, but that's another thing that, that can affect that area. But that degenerative process in that small breed dogs, that's probably the most common heart disease that, that we see. Okay, but now the murmurs, that can also be found later on in an older dog. Yeah. So, you know, if it's a small breed dog, you're often thinking, be like, it, it, are, yeah. is something going on with those valves or, or any of these other processes mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about uh, could cause um, a murmur. Um, so that's like the most common valve disease that we see. We can see a lot of congenital issues with the valves. That would be like stenosis, so pulmonic, pul pulmonic stenosis, aortic stenosis, and that's where we don't have a good opening in, in these valves. Uh, so they're made kind of tight to begin with. They don't open up nice like a, a trap door. They only open up a, a little bit. And so that's going to cause, you know, backup uh, of different things. Um, and uh, that's kind of your more, uh, more common valve issues. Is it treatable? Yeah, so treatable, not curable. So let's talk about what happens Manageable. here. Manageable. Yeah, so okay. let's talk about what happens here. We're gonna focus on our, our like mitral valve disease, tricuspid mm -hmm. valve disease, and our, our small breed dog since that's most common, okay? So we talked about um, blood is regurgitating back up from the ventricle, can be either side, mm -hmm. uh, into the atrium. Okay, the heart is a muscle, okay? Uh, let's think about other muscles in our body, all right? Um, if you decide you're gonna start running, okay? 
uh, what do your muscles do? They start to grow and adapt and make changes so that you can go and run and do it uh, efficiently without putting a strain on your mm -hmm. body, right? The heart is a muscle, it can do the same thing. So for a time, uh, the, this muscle is going to adapt. It's going to say, okay, I'm getting more volume and more pressure than I'm used to, and it will compensate in a way that will keep up with that, okay? So we can have dogs, really with any of these heart diseases that we're talking about, uh, where maybe we'll pick it up on uh, exam, but the dog's not sick from it yet. And that's because the heart can do some compensation. Mm -hmm. So let's say that process goes on. Eventually, the heart's not going to be able to keep up with it. Years and years of this backflow, this extra pressure, this extra volume, this chamber is going to start to get bigger. Okay? And we can see that on things like x-ray. Okay? You can see that this chamber is getting big. It's starting to push things out of the way. Maybe it's pushing on some of the airways uh, that are there, uh, causing a cough or something like that. Let's say that continues to happen. If we're in the left heart, okay, left atrium, left ventricle, uh, what's getting backed up? This over here, right? So we have all this extra pressure on the left side of the heart. Now this blood from the lungs, it can't just flow in freely like it used to because there's all this extra pressure in this area, so it's backing it up this way. Mm -hmm. So if you take a garden hose, right, and you kink it off, the pressure all builds up behind it, right, sure. from the kink point, you know, and so that's what's happening here. And so when we have increased pressure in one of these vessels, like your garden hose, eventually uh, fluid is gonna start to leak out, right? Blood vessels aren't, aren't uh, tight, you know, they have these, these little gaps, these little junctions, so that nutrients and stuff can, can get out. And so eventually fluid is gonna start to leak out. Well, if this is coming from the lungs, where's that fluid gonna go? The lungs. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's where we talk about um, left-sided congestive heart failure. So the left side of the heart is failing. It's backing up, it's backing up. It's just like plumbing, right? And eventually it backs up into an area that can't handle that extra resistance. And so we get the fluid that comes out and it fills the lungs with fluid. And how would I as a pet owner know that something like that was going mm -hmm. on? So uh, coughing, respiratory distress, difficulty breathing. Respiratory distress meaning? Uh, they're like panicking, having, having a difficulty breathing. But doesn't it also happen with older pets automatically too? They, they start breathing a little bit heavier, don't they? It should never be distress. Okay. Like they shouldn't be sitting there like, you know, like having, oh, okay. a, having right. a hard right. time right. breathing or like looking like they can't catch their breath. Um, if they're having difficulty breathing, you might notice like blue or pale gums. Uh, that's another hmm. thing you can check for uh, because we know they're not getting oxygenated. Um, exercise intolerance, you know, oh, my dog used to be able to, to walk three or four miles, no problem. Now we get to like a half mile, one mile, and he just kind of lays down. Is this you know, when that's you, suspicious. Get, you get the coughing of the dog sometimes yeah, too? Yeah, so this would have a coughing dog. This left side issue uh, would right. have a coughing because the fluid is building up in the lungs. If there's fluid in the lungs, uh, it's irritating. Uh, the body's trying to get it out, and we don't get good oxygen exchange. Okay. Okay? That's real common, that congestive heart right. difficulty. So so what happens uh, if we're on the right side of the heart? Okay, same process. This valve is faulty, so when the right ventricle squeezes, it comes back up to the right atrium. And where is it going to back up to? The body. Right. Okay, so right-sided congestive heart failure dogs, they accumulate fluid uh, anywhere where this big vessel is collecting from. So they tend to get fluid in their belly. So they'll come in and have a big distended belly. Um, you can feel fluid in it. You know, if you tap one side of the belly and feel the other, you can feel a fluid wave go through uh, to your hand. They may have difficulty breathing as well, not because there's fluid in the lungs, but because there's so much fluid, it's putting pressure on the diaphragm, and they can't take a big breath. Okay, the, the, um, the heart murmur, mm -hmm. that occurs over a period of time, generally, usually congenital, Sometimes congenital. Sometimes congenital. This degenerative process is most common. Um, infection, again, that's not super okay. common. But usually it's present, you know, for a little bit. They don't just, like, go into heart failure. Okay, what about the backing up? How, uh, mm -hmm. Does that happen quickly or slow? Or? I mean, it takes time, you know, uh, because remember, the heart is compensating for, you know, sure. months to years. And then eventually it just can't compensate 
anymore. And that's whenever people probably notice it, the coughing, the excessive amount of right. coughing. And, so and that's that kind of where stuff. your your kind of routine twice a year geriatric exams mm -hmm. come into play. If we can catch a heart murmur early and you know maybe take some x-rays or, or something uh, and catch it early, there are things that we can do about it to slow down that process. If your dog comes in in heart failure, there's still stuff we can do, but you're behind the eight ball, all right? The, the, the heart is already failing, so now we have to get it out of failure and try and keep it out of failure. Medication, mm -hmm. generally? Yeah, so... Uh, are both the, all these are medication, generally? Yes, yep. So with these uh, valve uh, issues, um, particularly the, the small dogs with our like uh, bicuspid or tricuspid valve disease, there's a medication called uh, Pimobendin. That's the drug name. Vetmedin is the, uh, the trade name. And uh, a couple summers ago, they did this big study where basically they took dogs you know, with, with this disease, they gave some of the medicine, uh, others didn't get the medicine, and they kind of monitored the, the progression. Mm -hmm. And they found that the dogs that got the Pimobendin earlier on had a slower onset uh, to the time of, of heart failure. And it was a pr pretty significant difference. So if we can diagnose that particular type of valve disease, then that's a, an early option that we have to kind of intervene and maybe slow things down. That drugs makes these ventricles contract more effectively, so it gets more blood uh, going out to where it's supposed to be, and it helps dilate some of the uh, vessels um, so they can get more oxygen and things like that. And then it might be doing something structurally, you know, on a genetic level to help with, with those changes. When we're talking about, I'm probably uh, jumping the gun here, but we're talking about using LASIK or something like that because the accumulation of fluid, is yeah. that something that would happen with the ones coming in from the, when it backs up here? Anywhere. Oh, so, okay. yeah. So, um, uh, we'll talk more about some of the, the medicines here uh, in a little bit, but, um, yeah, so that's doing some things to help pull fluid off, uh, okay. essentially. Um, so that's our, that's our valve disease. Um, let's talk about the heart muscles, okay? So that, that's, you know, the muscle around these chambers mm -hmm. here, okay? Um, so that would be a cardiomyopathy, uh, a disease. Myopathy is a muscle disease, mm -hmm. cardio, heart muscle disease. Uh, that's a disease of this muscle uh, in particular. The most common one we're seeing there is dilated cardiomyopathy. So these chambers um, start to stretch out and get bigger and bigger as a primary issue. Remember we talked about this atrium stretching out secondary to the faulty valve. Mm -hmm. With dilated cardiomyopathy, the initial problem is those uh, chambers are stretching out. And if we're making this muscle thinner and thinner and thinner, how well can it contract? Not very well, right? Um, so they start to get some contractility issues and the same sorts of things can happen. You know, if you're not squeezing everything out, it starts to back up and so on and so forth. We see that a lot in our Dobermans. Um, so that's a, a particular mm. breed uh, that's that. Larger breed dogs are more predisposed to, to that. Um, that happens over time generally. Yes. Again, okay. it's not like, you know, <laughs> Monday the heart is okay. normal, Tuesday it's this big ball and it's all stretched out, right? Right, okay. It, it takes time. And how do we diagnose that with x-rays? Um, so yeah, with, with all of these, uh, there's a hierarchy of diagnostics that I'll get into in a little bit, but yeah, uh, x-rays is one of the ways, mm -hmm. but then you got to follow it up with something. Um, Another uh, reason that we're seeing this, uh, we used to see it a lot, is taurine deficiency, right? So taurine is uh, uh, an amino acid that uh, helps with muscle development and maintenance and those sorts of things. If you're deficient in that, um, then you can't maintain this muscle and it will stretch out over time. So you used to see it, you know, back in like the 70s and stuff when um, pet food wasn't really well regulated. Um, and so there wasn't enough in it, and these dogs would get this, you know, dilated cardiomyopathy and things like that. Let's, um, see, let's go back. Tarring? What was tarring. It? Yeah, it's an amino acid. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a tarring deficiency, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So okay. we're starting to see an interesting trend now with uh, a lot of the grain-free dog foods, okay? So um, let, let, grain-free food, um, it's kind of a fad diet, if you will, okay? There's no real scientific reason why that is of benefit. In the human side of things, grain-free is kind of trendy, right? People are trying to avoid mm -hmm. gluten, uh, and some people need that. You know, they have sensitivities or intolerance to that, and you know, that's important, but it's kind of, it, it's, it's trendy in the human world. So 
what happens on the pet food side of it, you know, they try and do the same thing because people uh, often assume, oh, if I'm not eating that, then my dog shouldn't be eating it either. So there's no real absolute 100% proof that grain-free is that much better? Right. So um, there... We'll have to talk about that in another program because an awful lot of people are leaning towards this grain-free yes. grain food. Yes, it, and it's more expensive and there's just no real scientific data that it's of benefit. Um, there's been, I think, like maybe a couple of cases of gluten allergy reported. One was in uh, a litter of Irish setters back in the 80s, and I can't remember the other. So, like, gluten really isn't, you know, an issue. I will say I've had a couple of patients that maybe their skin issues or GI issues responded to mm -hmm. it. Was that it being grain-free? Was it switching the type of grain? was it switching the type of protein. A lot of the grain-free ones often have, you know, yeah. bison, kangaroo, <laughs> venison, you know, a different protein. So was the, the initial issue uh, uh, of true food allergy, which is usually to the protein, um, I, I don't know. So I can't, I can't comment on that. But um, in talking with some of the cardiologists, they're actually starting to see what they think may be associated with like some taurine deficiency or, or something that dog breeds that don't normally get dilated cardiomyopathy are getting it. And, and one of the common factors uh, seems to be this, this grain-free food. Now, they're not implicating uh, any brands or anything like that. They are seeing some trends. I'm not going to say anything here. No. Um, but uh, the, the common uh, ingredients are, as a, a grain substitute, things like um, legumes, uh, peas, stuff like that. You can find a whole list on online of all the different ones to watch out for. Uh, some of those alternate proteins like kangaroo and stuff like that. A lot of those like boutique brands, you know, that are kind of like little hipster brands, stuff like that. You can spend um, one day on Facebook and find a uh, hundred different studies yeah. that probably aren't necessarily so true, but it's right. all over Facebook. So sure. I don't want to get too much into the nutrition of it, but that's a kind of a new mm -hmm. form of dilated cardiomyopathy that we're seeing. The trend seems to be that there's some link to grain-free food. So if a, a patient comes in and they're on it, I just have that discussion like, hey, we're noticing some of these trends. Um, go check your food bag. Um, if it has, you know, some of those particular things as the first ingredients, maybe consider a change. You know, maybe talk about what their reasoning was for going on it anyway. Sometimes it's just, you know, that's what the breeder had it on. He liked the food, so I kept him on right. it. You know, it's not... I saw it. It, it looked like a good deal. I uh, think I'll try it. Right. I've heard of the brand. Yeah. They're supposed to be a good brand. You know, it, it's not always that they think grain is bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's often, you know, something else. So do you, just having that conversation and seeing maybe is there something else we should switch to or is the one that feeding actually okay maybe it doesn't have any of those you know higher risk ingredients so right. um, just something new that's kind of up and coming um, that we're seeing um, other causes of heart muscle disease um, I've seen um, uh, like parvovirus and puppies mm -hmm. you know usually you think vomiting diarrhea low white blood cell red blood cell counts those sorts of things but it can get at the heart muscle too um, so infectious causes uh, different things like that what about heartworm? Yeah, all right, so let's move on to that. Because that is something we're all... Yeah. Is that, I mean, we've got to ask that because so many of us now have been talked into heartworm medicine. Right. For our dogs, is it really something we should be doing? And what yes. is the effect and what I type just, of situation yeah. would cause so, it? Yeah, let, so let's let talk about geographic area. The hotbed for heartworm disease is like the south. You know, mm -hmm. it's hot and humid more year-round. Heartworm is spread by mosquitoes, okay? We have a lot of mosquitoes here, right? So there's the potential uh, for uh, more infections to occur. How many do we see? Probably two or three cases a year. Um, why, do we, why do we push the prevention so much? Um, heartworm prevention uh, is very easy to give. It's very safe to give. Uh, treating heartworm disease, once they have it, extremely dangerous, uh, oh, dangerous and, and very expensive, okay? Uh, so that's and one sometimes reason. fatal. I mean, you sometimes can't treat it, correct? Re there can be reactions and stuff right. that, that complicate it. The other reason, um, and you know, let's say your argument is like, oh, we don't really have heartworm around here. Why am I going to spend the money on it? The heartworm preventatives also prevent a lot of the gastrointestinal parasites, hookworms, roundworms, whipworms, those sorts of things. Those are very prevalent in our oh, area. God, yes. Some of those things they can pass to us. You know, like the roundworms and things like that that can cause 
really bad issues uh, in people. So it's kind of a protection for us too. How often does your dog go outside and eat, you know, God knows what? So there's the potential. The yeah, there's exactly. There's the potential for exposure there, especially if there's young kids in the house uh, or elderly people, you know, not grooming, you know, as well or as often or have weakened immune systems, things like that. So it, it kind of uh, has a, a multifaceted um, protection to it. So heartworm uh, itself is kind of a misnomer. Okay, um, it actually lives uh, in this pulmonary artery here. Okay. So it probably should be called like pulmonary artery worm or something like that. <laughs> Maybe we could rename it and become famous. Yeah. It might work. So um, it, it goes, you know, so a mosquito bites the dog, it transmits a, a larva, um, and it goes in here and it starts to mature uh, in this pulmonary artery. Mm -hmm. Eventually uh, it's going to grow up and it's going to become an adult worm. And just like some of the other stuff we've talked about, there's only so much room here. So it's going to start backing up, right? So the worms are going to back up into this uh, right ventricle, okay? Now, now we have a blockage here, right? So then that cycle starts all over again. So, you know, blood can't pump as well through here. So the worms start backing up through this valve. We can get some murmurs. And eventually they get into this caudal vena cava. You can see caval syndrome, which is where the heartworm disease is so bad. This whole right heart is compromised. And now you're seeing signs with the liver and in the abdomen because it's all backed up. When okay? do we start, I'm going to digress here for a minute, mm -hmm. when, do we, when do we start giving dogs heartworm medicine? So um, you can study, start it. Because um, I bet everybody, most of the people that are listening yeah, like to this are probably 12 on. 12 weeks of age. Um, testing can be done uh, as early as six months of age. So that's another thing we do annually. We run the heartworm uh, tick disease screening test. So again, some people say, oh, we don't have that heart, much heartworm disease. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do that. Well, um, if your dog were to happen to get heartworm and we give, wish you did. And we give the, and we, well, one, we may not know about it if we don't mm -hmm. test. Two, if they have it and we give the prevention, they can have a severe reaction to it, which could be fatal. So you want to know it's safe to give that prevention so you can have those benefits. And then in our geographic area, the same test is screening for all the tick-borne diseases. I can't even tell you how many cases of, of Lyme or at least exposure to Lyme that we've picked up early just by running that test annually. If my dog is on heartworm medicine year-round, mm -hmm. do I still have to do that test? Yeah, because Why? nothing's 100%, right? Um, and the ticks. That's what okay. I tell people. Um, you don't, a lot of, I, so many of the Lyme disease dogs I see, people say, I never saw a tick on the dog. How often can you find a, a tick on your dog? You know what I mean? Unless they're practically bald and you're I like know. going over with a fine tooth comb. Like Martin with his long hair, you, you would never know, right? People find them a lot. I mean, not a lot, but they a do, lot of but people do find them. They also don't find them a lot, too. And, and so there's that issue. So. That, that's the benefit of the test, um, and that's kind of all I'll say on that. But, you know, the treatment, uh, we know that the heartworms harbor a particular type of bacteria, so we have to treat for that bacteria. You have to treat the worms. It's, it's a long process. The medication's very expensive. Um, you can have, you cure? You, you have can't to, be cured? It can be treated, okay. yeah. You have to give steroids to help with the reaction that starts to happen when you start killing off the worms. So that has risks with it. Um, and some dogs, if it's uh, severe enough, We'll go down through the jugular vein, a uh, cardiologist with a little scope and, and pull the worms out, which is oh, that's special. satisfying to watch. Um, yes. So all sorts of stuff like that. But if one dog in a, in a family gets heartworm, is it contagious from one dog to another? There has to be a mosquito involved. So the okay. mosquito would have, the dog first would have to have the right life stage. Uh, there's multiple different mm -hmm. life stages. So the mosquito would have to bite, get that infectious life stage, go over and take a blood meal from the other dog to transmit that larva in. So actually the transmission from one dog to another is not all that terribly common. It can happen, but it's... It's not common here, but right. down south. Well, we're not in the south. Yeah, but how many people do you know that go south for the winter? I don't know, I'm thinking I've got five dogs. I don't want one to get it all, yeah. all but together. It, no, it's not like, you okay. know... Uh, Martin has it, and then Tyler comes up and licks him, you know, and he yeah. gets it. There's got to be a mosquito okay. involved, and it's got to be at the, the right time. Okay, I'm a little less nervous now yeah. about that. Um, okay. But still, prevention year-round, um, do the test. It gives us, both things give us more protection or more information than just the heartworm-related issue, okay. uh, which is advantageous. Um, so that's probably the most common, like, uh, vessel issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so then our last system would be our conduction system, right? 
we've got our, our sinus node, our AV node, and then our little uh, per, uh, bundle of hyssen, Purkinje fibers, coming down here. And so those are, are the, the, conduct, uh, the conductatory system. Now, the cells in there are pretty cool, right? So normally your neurons, um, you know, it, it generates a signal, an electric signal, and it goes and it tags the next neuron, and it, it sends a signal down until it gets to the muscle or, you know, the intestine or whatever, and it stimulates it and it does its thing, right? These cells are kind of uh, uh, self-stimulating or autonomic. And so instead of like relying on something else to give it the signal, they're kind of always trending upward. They send their signal, kind of calm down, and then they just self, they've got these little ion channels that let electrolytes come in and out. And so that's always happening and it keeps that gradient going. Boop, they send their next signal. Hmm. And what does the signal do? It makes the heart beat, right? Um, so since we have you know our two nodes and our bundle and then our little fibers you can have interruption anywhere along that way that's usually going to cause a slower heart rate right so if this node isn't working correctly it's not sending its signal as often and so you get a low heart rate do you see a lot of that uh not a ton every once in a while those are often your dogs that are passing out right uh, because what happens is there, there's a hierarchy here, okay? So let's say we have a chihuahua, okay? This, this node up here should be going every uh, 120 beats per minute, uh, it should be, you know, firing mm -hmm. uh, its signal. So every half second, it should be going, right? So let's say that's not working. Well, then this node, and we're just making up numbers here, but it, it, it's kind of a, a backup. So it's like, all right, if I don't get stimulated by you know, the head cheese, I still got to send some signal or like we're going down here. So it'll go at like say 100 beats per minute, okay? So if it doesn't get a signal from this one, it, it'll send its own signal, but at a slower rate. Because you don't want it to go backwards. If this one's beating faster, then your signal's not going to go in the right direction. Right. There's, there's an electronic signal that goes in this direction. So if this one's beating faster than this one, then it's going to be sending signals and you'll have stuff contracting all out of whack, right? We want our atria to contract first, boink, send the blood down, and then our ventricles to contract. We don't want to ha that to happen backwards, right. okay? And in the same way, so let's say both of these fail, then these fibers down here are going to start to send a signal, but it might be at like 60 or 80 beats a minute, and that's not ideal that Chihuahua's not going to be able to go out and, you know, attack the postman or, you know, <laughs> beg for its treat or, you know, whatever they like to do, but it'll keep the dog alive, okay? Um, but, you know, especially as you get down here, it's going to change the electronic current through the heart, so it is going to be going backwards. It's going to make those ventricles contract, which is what is going to maintain life, but it's not going to go in the right order. So with those sorts of things, you're talking about your electrocardiogram or your mm -hmm. ECG. And that uh, is a test that lets us look at the, the electronic conduction system of the heart. Uh, you can tell which chambers are contracting when and in what direction that current is going. And so um, you may see abnormalities there, like you might see a big wave that's associated with these ventricles uh, that goes in, in uh, kind of the wrong direction. And let, let's get into tests now, I guess, since we've covered right. some of the main things there. So a normal um, ECG is going to look, you know, something... Which is electrocardiogram. Yeah, electrocardiogram, or EKG might hear. It mm -hmm. was started in Germany, so cardio in German begins with a K. Um, same thing. This is kind of our normal one, okay? So this first little bump, that's our atrium uh, contracting, okay? Remember, they're muscular, but they're not as strong as these lower chambers, so it's a small little bump. This lower, or this, this big tall one, that's our ventricles contracting, okay? Remember, they're very strong. They're mm -hmm. gonna make a big current. And this little one here is everything kind of recharging, okay? Um, so everything fires, right? And then it's kind of, it's gotta recharge a little bit so it can fire again. So what happens when, when things go wrong? So if things are going wrong up here, maybe you see something uh, like uh, this. Like we don't have a beat, we don't have a beat, and then all of a sudden, you know, we get a real big beat and then it goes, okay? Okay. So that's kind of worst case scenario. That, that's those lower ones um, finally having to, to kick in, Working, okay? Yeah. Um, and so this big one is like these ventricles just boom, they had to contract, okay, to, to keep the dog alive. Um, so, so that's that. We can see things where um, maybe there's conduction disturbances. 
Um, so maybe, you know, this is firing, but there's a block down here. And so we get, you know, a little bump, a little bump, a little bump, and then finally we get a contraction of the ventricle. So, you know, this is sending a signal like, hey, please go, please go, please go. And then finally it gets through. Okay. Can most of the uh, veterinarians do uh, electrocardiograms? Yeah, it's a very, very common test. I think, you know, pretty much any place should have it because it's standard for um, like monitoring anesthesia and stuff like that. Uh, but it can be a, a diagnostic tool um, as well. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, you'll be doing like a routine dental or something like that. You know, you've done the blood work beforehand, it's normal, you've listened to the heart, everything sounds good, and then, you know, under anesthesia, you know, that heart's under a little more stress maybe, or, or things are more relaxed, and uh, you start to see some abnormal rhythm. Mm -hmm. So that prompts you to know, stop the procedure, wake them up, and then you can talk about, you know, more workup. So kind of the, the gold standard test, right? Um, if you want to get the most information about what's going on in the heart is an echocardiogram. You'll hear a card an echo for short. It's essentially an ultrasound of the heart, okay? And that's usually done by a, a, a veterinary cardiologist. Um, and they use the ultrasound and they look at all these chambers, they look at all the vessels, they look at all these valves, all these structures we've been talking about. They can visualize those, they take measurements of them, they can measure the velocity of blood, like let's say there's a, a valve issue and it's mm -hmm. regurgitating, they can measure the velocity of that. It, it's pretty impressive. And then at the same time, they have the dog hooked up to an ECG. So they can visualize what they're seeing with any abnormal uh, rhythms that might be happening too. And that's usually done by a specialist. Correct, yeah. Like that PVSCC or someplace right. like that. Okay. that's correct. Um, so or that, Cle someplace in Cleveland or Ohio. Or, or Akron, like yeah. Right, yeah. Akron. So that's kind of your, your gold standard. Um, now, how many of our, our patients, you know, go down for an echocardiogram? You know, it's, it's probably less than half, um, you know, cost, uh, travel time, uh, different things like that. Uh, but that's kind of the, the most accurate test, uh, if you will. Uh, the other imaging modality we have is x-rays, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so oftentimes, you know, if we hear a murmur for the first time or, you know, we, we just need to know more about the chest, we'll take that chest x-ray. And we can actually measure um, the heart on a chest x-ray. There's a, a special um, system we use called the vertebral heart score. And it basically compares the size of the heart to the dog's vertebrae. Why do we do that? If you look at like a bulldog chest, this short, <laughs> wide, you know, triangle compared to like a greyhound, this long, lean, slender thing, um, the bulldog, even with a normal heart, it might look huge, right? Just because of the shape of their chest. But if you measure it out compared to the vertebrae, you know, part of their skeletal system, it actually mm -hmm. measures normal. And then we have some uh, standard numbers that are set in place so we know, you know, what's normal and what's not normal. Uh, so we can do things like that. That will show us, you know, is there fluid backing up, uh, especially if the lungs sound abnormal, um, different things like that. So it gives us a lot of information if we can't go uh, for the echocardiogram. We talked about ECG already, and those are kind of our three like big tests. Now, uh, if there's heart issues going on, we may uh, recommend blood work um, because a lot of our heart medications can impact the kidneys or electrolytes. And so you kind of want to know, you know, what the kidneys are up to. Are the electrolytes stable before I start this medicine? And that's always a, a risk uh, of treating any heart disease is you've got to use, you know, these medications to get things under control. But if the dog, like an older dog, has kidney disease too, you could push the kidneys over the edge as well. So, you know, we always, you know, talk about that. The heart disease is probably going to kill them a lot faster than the kidney disease will. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're still, you know, being careful, but um, just uh, something to think about there and why some other tests uh, might be recommended. So, uh, treatment. Um, we talked about the, the Pimobendin or the Vetmedin uh, as an option. Um, Lasix you mentioned, so that's mm -hmm. a, a loop diuretic is where it's classified. Uh, a lot of people call it like a water pill. Uh, it works at the level of the kidneys, okay? So in the kidneys, the little tubules there are normally uh, reabsorbing electrolytes and water comes with that, right? Just like uh, it's, it's saltier and so water comes with it. Mm -hmm. It's just a normal gradient. Uh, Lasix or furosemide, that's the drug name, 
tells those little receptors just to leave those electrolytes. So the water doesn't come with it, the water goes out. So it's gonna get rid of more water, it's gonna decrease uh, the pressure within the vessels, and so in the lungs or wherever, uh, where that extra fluid is building up, it's gonna kind of reverse that process. So instead of staying stuck in the lung tissue, it'll go back in. How long does it take to have that happen? Uh, I mean, for it all to go away, I would imagine you're going to tell me that all of it never goes away. You can get it to all go away. Oh, can you, Ron? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're talking like days. Now, what's also interesting about Lasix is it has some bronchodilatory effects. So if a dog comes in in heart failure, you'll often see one of us runs and gets an injection of it and gives it IV. Because if you give it IV, it'll have that fluid effect, but it will also help open up the airways, which can get more oxygen hmm. into that struggling dog. Um, we have things like ACE inhibitors, uh, so enalapril is a common one. Um, with heart disease, there's this whole interplay that goes on, which we won't get into, but it involves the kidneys and some steroids and things like that, and it causes basically blood pressure to increase. Um, so ACE inhibitors, that's an enzyme that you know it's in the lung that's causing that process. It's protective for a while, but then it becomes detrimental, so that works there and it also just kind of helps with all that pressure stuff to, to get fluid back down. Uh, we talked about the Pimo Bandit, and then the fourth one we often use is a spironolactone. That's another diuretic. It's not as potent as the Lasix is, so it doesn't get as much water off, um, but there's some good data, especially in the human world, that on a, a molecular level, it changes how rapidly these cells are going through the changes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of slows the progression of heart failure. So it's not really doing a whole lot to pull that fluid off, but it can help with how fastly the heart disease progresses. Uh, a lot of these guys we get out of failure. They may have to be on four medications for the rest of their life to keep them out of failure. Obviously, if you can get them off some, that's always ideal. Um, but they can go on to live happy and healthy lives. Um, so let's say we get them out of heart failure. Um, what do you do then? We're usually talking diet change. Um, there's a special heart diet um, that people will use. It's very expensive. Uh, so the joint diet like that Hills makes is, is very uh, equivocal to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the one cardiologist I studied with would recommend that uh, just due to, to cost issues. It's still more expensive than your regular food, but not quite as bad. We can see what's called cardiac cachexia, which is the heart is just working so hard to try and keep up that it's just draining nutrients from everywhere. So these dogs can drop a ton of weight. You know, so sometimes that's what we'll find. Somebody comes in, you know, I think my dog's losing a lot of weight. We listen, find a heart murmur, take an x-ray, the heart is huge, uh, and it, it's that cardiac cachexia. The, the heart's just been working so hard, right. it's a muscle, so it's just taking all those nutrients. So those foods, you know, help keep more calories on. Um, just like people, avoiding salty things um, that are going to increase volume, you know. Uh, we don't see like fat deposits in, in dogs like we do in people. You know, people talk about getting like a blocked uh, vessel or something like right. that. That doesn't really happen in dogs. It happens in birds. Um, oh, it does? We can talk about that some other oh, day. Wow. Um, but so, you know, avoiding those sorts of things, being cognizant of, of what you're feeding, opting for some healthy snacks. Um, and we don't want them to be couch potatoes. You know, obviously if they're in heart failure, you know, don't take them for a walk or whatever. But you know, once they're stable and get out, they can go for a walk, you know, they can have a good time. Should they go hike, you know, 20 miles or, you know, leap and jump and catch the frisbee? No, probably not. That might be a little too much stress. But. Do a lot of dogs, as they get older, suffer from heart disease? It's, yeah, it's pretty common. As mm -hmm. common as cancer? Um, I mean, that, that's a hard question to answer. Um, we probably see more like tumors and things, mm -hmm. but I mean heart disease is pretty common. So um, and we're, um, we're beginning to run out of time here, but so what do I want to do? Go out and buy a stethoscope? <laughs> <laughs> so just know how to check your dog's pulse. Uh, find them now. Yeah. Everybody, everybody that's watching this, we hope we go yeah. try and find um, them. Pay attention to gum color, you know, see what that looks like normally. So if they're having any issues, you can check that. Take your dog to their wellness exams. If they're geriatric, over six years of age, they should go twice a year. Catch this stuff early. If you catch it early, you can do something about it and prevent it from getting to the failure point, often for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and then just watch out for those clinical signs, you know, weight loss, coughing, difficulty breathing, 
um, exercise intolerance, trouble going up the stairs, you know, those sorts of things that might tip you off that something's going on internally. And what was the one that I wanted us to discuss, the cardiomyopathy? Myop yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was like the dilated cardiomyopathy or the nutritional one right, or the, right. the viral, those sorts of things. Wow. A lot to learn. Yeah. <laughs> And there is always the option of going to a heart specialist, and you say there are them in, in of course, yep. Ohio and down at uh, PBSCC. Yeah, so, you know, the Pittsburgh. typical conversation is, okay, we heard this murmur, we took this x-ray, this is what we see. Um, if you want to know more about what's going on specifically, we recommend you see the, the cardiologist. Um, if that's not an option, then, hey, this is what we'll do to, to try and slow it down and keep uh, he or she comfortable as long as possible. If you do want to go and get that extra information, um, then we'll set it up, you know, fax down the referral and, and see what we can find out that way. Okay, anything else we should tell people? I think, I think that's about it. I think we've covered <laughs> an awful lot. Okay, again, if you come up with a topic you'd like us to discuss, I hope this answered the questions of the people that were asking me to do this. And if you think of some other uh, situation, because we've been thinking of some other ones, <coughs> pardon me, the people have talked about mm -hmm. recently that we're going to also do. Again, thank you, Dr. Consler. You're Appreciate welcome. it. And if you have any questions, uh, to give Dr. Consler a call or, of course, contact your own veterinarian and tell them if you see, think you see any of these things that might be of interest to you and to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.